and turn with me to First Peter chapter five and a couple verses there. We got a, a bunch of other verses that we'll use as well as uh, we wrap up this whole series we've been doing on the fivefold gifts of the ministry uh, for the church. And I'm kind of glad it's coming to an end. I'm ready to move on, but it's been great. I've learned so much, and I want just to let you know how important it is these five gifts that Jesus has given in the church. That was what we've learned in Ephesians 4.11, that Jesus gave these five gifts. And I don't want to just settle for one or two or three. I want all five. Amen? If Jesus gives us this gift, we need to have it. And uh, the gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teachers. Now, many of us could define what a pastor is because for most of us, that's what we're familiar with when it comes to the church. And we've been using this wheel to help us illustrate that we need all, all the spokes in the wheel in operation so that this wheel can bear the load and, and can, can do what it's supposed to do. And oftentimes in our church circles and what we've grown up with, I really think the church has been out of balance because all we really know of is what a pastor does. These other ones, not so much. Evangelists, um, Wow, I thought I was bleeding there for a moment. Look at that. <laughs> from here, like, what happened? <laughs> Whew, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, what's an apostle? What's a prophet these days? And a teacher? And, you know, those are some that we might struggle to be able to define um, because we're familiar with what a pastor is. But how many know if Jesus gave that gift, we need to understand what it is? We may not how to know how to put it into practice, but at least we need to... We need to know more about that. And uh, the role of the pastor, that's, that's kind of an easy one. Um, and because we're so familiar with pastor, we know what, you know, we got a, the one-fold ministry going, but the five-fold ministry, what's that? Um, the pastor kind of is the catch-all ministry. The pastor is kind of does about, does everything. Now, fortunately, we're in a big enough church where we have staff, and I don't have to do some of those things, but there's a lot of churches under 50 people, under 100 people, that the pastor pretty much does everything. The pastor is expected to be the leadership expert, like John Maxwell. Oh, he knows leadership so well. Uh, the pastor is expected to be an expert Bible teacher, an exegete, and, uh, you know, the scriptures from the original Hebrew and the Greek, I mean, hey, he's got to know how to teach the scriptures. The pastor's going to be the caretaker, the counselor. He's going to go to every hospital for every visit. He's going to be available for every marriage and family crisis. That's what's expected of the pastor, right? Uh, the pastor is going to be the community evangelist. There's nobody who the pastor can't lead to Jesus. He just knows what to say at the right time, right? Uh, the pastor's also, he's like the prophet. He, he, he needs to be able to predict the future. Pastor, what's going to happen? Well, all this stuff happening, what, what does it mean? We have to assess and address all the cultural things happening, and man, uh, that's a big load. And he's also the political, or she's a political analyst. Boy, we came through that this last fall. You know, Pastor, are you progressive? Are you liberal? Are you conservative? Do you support this person or that person? And man, we've been, you know, have to be the political analyst. And then we got to be the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer. We got to learn how to, uh, to know how to run a board. Um, and uh, then there's nothing too low. I mean, even, even the toilet bowl cleaner. And you know me, and nothing's too low for me to do. That's, uh, I, I'll, I'll get my hands dirty and do anything that needs to be done. But if you look at it, that's, that's a lot, isn't it? That, that, that's a lot. Maybe some unrealistic assumptions and expectations. Maybe it's not even a biblical uh, job description, but it's a heavy load. No wonder why. 1,500 ministers leave the ministry every month. Did you know that? 1,500 ministers leave the ministry every month. And COVID has made it worse. There's a lot of empty churches in our country. And they're emptying out more and more as far as spiritual leadership. And I really believe that's because we've been kind of out of balance. We're using maybe one gift in the church of pastor when Jesus gave five gifts. So that's why we've been doing this series, and I've saved the pastor for last because that's one that, you know, we're a little bit more familiar with. And if you look in the New Testament, uh, the New Testament uses a number of different terms for pastor that is interchangeable. You'll see uh, words like uh, bishop 
or priest or elder or overseer, presbyter or deacon, though they have uh, minutely different definitions, they're interchangeable when it comes to spiritual leadership as defined in the New Testament. The one we're most familiar with is, is pastor. And that one really, another word for that is shepherd. Um, and so let's look at uh, some verses in Scripture that kind of help us see the pastor as a shepherd, as a caretaker of the flock. Somebody's going to lead the, the flock to green pastures so they're going to eat well. And you're going to protect them with the shepherd's crook, you know, the staff. So now Peter, one of the main apostles, he's writing about church leadership after Jesus was already gone. So he says, uh, and now a word to you who are elders um, or pastors or bishops or overseers. He says, I too am an elder. So even the apostle Peter identified himself with one of those interchangeable terms, uh, elder. He says, I appeal to you, and this is what he appeals us to do, care for the flock. Again, there's that idea of shepherding. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. He goes on to say, don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them. There again, there's that idea of shepherding. Lead them by your own good example. Just don't tell them the way to go. Show them. Lead them. Model for them um, the things of God. And he goes on to say, and when the great shepherd, now he's talking about Jesus, who's the great shepherd. So I'm really an under-shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd. I'm an under-shepherd. But when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. And then uh, the apostle Paul brings to this conversation the same idea of shepherding. Uh, before he gets to that, he talks about his life is... Look what it says. My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord. Don't you want that for your life? To, to know what your purpose is? Not just to have a job, not just to get a paycheck, but to really be fulfilled in why in the world you are on this earth for? I think that's the cry of all of our hearts. And Man, some of us find it and some of us, we're still searching for it. Um. But, I mean, you know, our church, I mean, we got 40 acres that we're looking forward to someday, maybe relocating. I mean, we got plans. We've got architects. We've got drawings. We've got a lot of things. But it'd be terrible to work at an assignment if it wasn't God's will or if God had something else for us. I don't want to just build a bigger church because that'll make me look like a better pastor, more successful church and more successful pastor. I don't want to fall into that trap. I want to do what God has assigned me. And Paul is saying the same thing. And who can outdo Paul? You know, I mean, look at all the churches he planted, all the miracles he did. He is even concerned that when my life is done, I want to make sure that I've finished well. I've finished the assignment given to me by the Lord. And that's the work of telling the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And so now he goes on to say, so guard yourselves and God's people, like shepherds, right? Guarding God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood. What a price that was paid for, the, for you and me. Over which, and this is an important part, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as elders. Now we get introduced to this idea of divine calling. That this is an appointment, a calling by God. Now, I've gone through Bible school. I've filled out all the paperwork, met all the criteria to have my papers and my credentials with the Assemblies of God, the, the denomination that we're a part of. Man has a way of credentialing and appointing and all these kind of things. And there's nothing wrong with that. There, there's, there's good things about that. But... Man can't call you to be a pastor, to be in the full-time ministry. That is something that the Scriptures say the Holy Spirit appoints and calls. Now, I'm going to speak a little bit more about that divine calling in, in just a minute. But I want to take you to some of the qualifications of a pastor. You know, there's some qualifications. 
And they're found in a couple different passages of Scripture, 1 Timothy 3 and then Titus 1. Uh, it's a litany or a list of all the qualifications of a pastor. Now get ready for this. There's some should nots and some shoulds for pastors. Are you ready to see what they are? Instead of going there and turning there, I'm just going to bullet point or list the, all the qualifications from this text of a pastor. Are you ready? Here's what a pastor should not be. He should not be violent or quarrelsome. Now, how many would say that's a good, good thing, right? <laughs> a pastor should not be quick-tempered. A pastor should not be arrogant. He shouldn't be a lover of money or she shouldn't be a lover of money. He shouldn't be a heavy drinker and shouldn't be a new believer. Now, all those make sense, right? That, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think a pastor should be like that, right? Now, what should he be like or she be like? Well, it should have a life above reproach. They should be wise, should be, have a good reputation, should be able to teach, have self-control, be faithful in marriage, um, be able to manage uh, his or her own family well. Now, you look at that, that's, that's a high bar, isn't it? Those are, that's a, that's a big qualification to be a pastor. I would like to say I knock all those out of the park, but uh, I'm still a work in progress myself. I sometimes can be arrogant. I can sometimes, well, maybe a couple of those in there. <laughs> um, but, you know, I look at this list, and wow, that's a big load to carry for any one person. But you know what? I want to suggest to you today that that's all of our qualifications, all of us. You know, I mean, you can't, I mean, I don't think it makes sense to look at the list and say, well, I know, I know the pastor uh, should be faithful to his wife, but, you know, I can, hey. Or, you know, I know the pastor, he, you know, he, he shouldn't be a lover of money, but I can. I mean, I can just whatever I need to do to make money. This is a qualification for all of us. All of us should live into holiness and righteousness. And, you know, we may never arrive completely, but God's continuing to help the fruit of His Spirit to work out in our lives. I mean, I've heard this phrase, and I've probably even preached this phrase, that, you know, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And I get that, and it sounds good. But that doesn't mean that we just discount holiness or righteousness or we just, you know, serve soft, serve ice cream when it comes to what we're to be as believers and followers of Jesus. I mean, this, this, is, this is a high calling. This is, this is a big list. But you know what? If you're a, a dad or a mom, or maybe, you know, you're the spiritual head of your home. So you are actually a pastor of your own church. You're a pastor of your own flock. So let me ask you the question, how healthy is your church? Are you raising kids that they know of, of what it means to be saved and they've got a firm foundation because they're going to get more from you spiritually and in every other way than a paid professional. So how healthy is your church? It's easy to look at the guy up here. Well, he's the pastor, but what about you? How well are you pastoring your family? How well are you pastoring your life in just surrounding yourself with God's Word and in a community of believers where there's accountability? You just can't get by with doing anything before somebody says, hey, listen, I know I'm not perfect, but listen, I, I, I saw you talk to this person this way. Is there anything we need to talk about? Or I see you doing this, or I haven't seen you at church for a long time. Are you Okay. You know, to where we have accountability around us. So we all, you know, have, you know, we have things and in, in ways that we need to live into, into the things of God. So there's really a calling upon all of our lives as believers and followers of Jesus. Now let me talk a few moments about this divine call. And I'll just kind of throw my life in the mix here this morning. Because I don't remember a time when I, all of a sudden, I knew I was called and uh, everything changed from that point. I mean, I heard like, you know, voices from heaven or saw the writing on the wall. I didn't have that kind of experience. For me, 
it wasn't really a divine calling. It was a divine wooing, <laughs> okay? Just kind of a, a wooing, just like with Connie. I mean, after our first date, I didn't say, Connie, you are called to be my wife, and, uh, you know, I'm called to be your husband. It was more like a, a wooing needed to take place. I really had to woo her <laughs> a lot. Maybe it was a divine wooing that God had to do in her before she said yes to me, right? And that's how it seemed, the calling of God seemed to work out. It was like a wooing. It was not all at once. There were pieces along the, the, the puzzle that began to take shape to create a picture of, of what God wanted to do. And so I could find out what my assignment was and finish my assignment. I've told my story in this whole series as uh, my life has been impacted by all five gifts, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, pastors, and teachers. And when I, uh, I, I told her the story a few weeks ago, how I came out of the Catholic Church, we were Catholics, and um, I was familiar with priests and nuns, but I had never heard the word pastor. I didn't know what a pastor was. Priests and nuns, I mean, I knew, and as a kid, I was afraid of those people. I mean, they were, it was just kind of different, you know, they kind of creepy almost in a sense. I was afraid of them. And, you know, they didn't get married. They had to take this oath of celibacy and all. I didn't understand all that. Who could do that, right? Um, So when I got born again and we started going to another church is when I was introduced to this whole idea of what a pastor is. And the first pastor that we had in our family was Pastor Spina and his wife, Beth. He was married. And he had a whole family. So already I could identify with him versus the, the priests and nuns. You know, I mean, he was kind of like an average, ordinary guy, being a, a roly-poly Italian guy. Spina was his last name. And, I mean, he was so interesting. He had all kinds of mob stories. I think every Italian has some kind of mob story, don't they? It's just, wow, really? You were connected? <laughs> you weren't in, but maybe you are connected. Uh, anyways, he, he had all kinds of stories. A uh, loving guy. His wife, uh, Beth, would come out to our house because my mom was a hairdresser. She had a shop in her home. and So she'd get her hair done. We'd get to know her. Her, she got to know our family because she was there every week. And um, so I was introduced to what a pastor was, and they were like normal people. And the first little church we went to, we, le- we left the Catholic cathedral and went into this church that was like a converted house. And there my mom and I are on the steps, so we went back to visit just a couple years ago, and there we are on the steps where really our faith began to grow as born-again believers. And... Um, it, that church grew until they got to the point where they needed to hire a youth pastor. We had so many young people in the church that uh, they hired a youth pastor. And the first youth pastor, his name was Pastor Don Austin. And that's a recent picture of him. But I love Pastor Don. And he may be tuning in right now because I, I got a hold of him this week and said, I'm probably going to mention your name, maybe have your mug shot up there. But, um, so, hi, Pastor Don. Anyways, uh, he, I loved him because he was an athlete. He was an athlete, and I was a wannabe athlete, and so I could identify with him. I mean, we played church softball together. We played in church basketball tournaments. I mean, we just connected. We hung out. I thought, what a a great guy. And so I got a different picture of what a youth pastor is all about. And as in the ministry happens, you know, there's a lot of pastoral transition. And a, a pastor will be at a church for a number of years and then move on to the next spot or whatever God has for them. And so uh, Pastor Don left, and we got another youth pastor, but he was much different than Pastor Don. We had Pastor Steve. And Pastor Steve came from the Jesus People movement. So sitting around a circle with a guitar, singing kumbaya, those kind of things, that came like natural to him. And uh, at first I was like, Ooh, I don't know about this. I kind of like Pastor Don better. We had a lot more fun. This is a little bit more like spiritual. But little did I know that Pastor Steve was going to influence me in the area of music and drama that God would use in my life years later and for years. I didn't see it at the time. I just thought, I just don't quite like his personality versus the other guy. But see, God, I I don't want to ever underestimate. I don't want you to underestimate the role of a youth pastor or a children's pastor. And, and maybe some of you come from churches where they weren't big enough to have full-time people like, like we do in that, those areas. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a, a vacation Bible school leader that, you know, just there was something about them that really encouraged you and helped you grow in your faith. Well, these pastors did that for me. And Pastor Steve, every once in a while, he'd say to me, 
as I was getting closer to graduating, he said, you know, Mike, I, I don't know, I, th- I think I, I sense a call of God on your life. Have you ever thought about the ministry? And I was, I was like, oh, Pastor Steve, no, I didn't, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not into that. No, not, not for me. And, but he kept prodding. He kept planting that little seed in my head and my heart. And I kind of pushed it away, and I got close to graduation. I thought, okay, what am I going to do with my life? And and I thought, well, you know, I love, I love hunting and fishing. I love the outdoors. So maybe I need to find a job where I can get paid to do that. So I thought, well, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a forest ranger, a forest ranger. Can you believe that your pastor wanted to be a forest ranger? And I thought, man, if I can get paid to be outdoors, why not? That'd be great. And so in Wisconsin, I went to the University of Wisconsin, and they had a great natural resources program. So I signed up to take those classes and and uh, being on the, on the secular campus there, I was a born-again Christian. I wasn't, uh, you know, ashamed of my faith. Uh, I didn't do a lot of the things that my fellow dorm guys were doing and didn't talk like them and did what they did. And so one by one, my room started to fill up with other guys in my dorm whose lives were, you know, just gradually falling apart and dealing with a lot of things. And all of a sudden, they were in my dorm room because they saw something different in me. And it's not that I banged people over the heads with the Bible, but a lot of it was just lifestyle evangelism, so to speak, and, but they took notice and they would, like, you know, what is it about you? You're just, you're just different. You don't do some of the stuff that we do. And um, one by one, I was able just to share with these guys. And it started to dawn on me that, you know what, maybe I'm not supposed to work with animals. Maybe I'm supposed to work with people. And so that very next year, I changed from natural resources to be a Smokey the Bear forest ranger. I changed that to psychology. <laughs> Thinking, well, you know, that's, that's kind of working with people. And so sure enough, I, you know, changed to psychology. And that year, it's only my second year of school, I was hired to be a resident advisor, an RA in the dorm. And again, that gave me a lot more opportunities to to speak to guys. I was leading now and, and speaking to more and more guys. My room was filling up and I was just really ministering to people. And that's when I met this next pastor. He was leading the Chi Alpha College Ministries group on our secular campus. And uh, we got to know each other. And he said, Hey, Mike, why don't you get some of your friends together in your dorm room? We'll do it before classes start. I'll just come over and we'll have a Bible study and maybe a time of prayer. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh, okay, that, that, that'll work. So uh, every Tuesday morning at 6.30 in the morning, this guy would come to our dorm room. Now, they would never let that happen these days, right, because <laughs> you can imagine. But it, it was okay back then. And, and he would come to my dorm room 6.30 every Tuesday, and he'd hold a Bible study. And, I mean, I'd try to get some people there, but I, th- I think it was more he wanted to do it than I really wanted to do it. But I was there, and, I'd, you know, I'd get a couple of people there. And... I, it struck me, you know, I just got to roll out of bed. You got to make, you got to come in and six, th- I mean, what is it with you that, why do you want to do that? And little by little, I got to understand his heart for ministry, his love for God's people. And it just started to do something to me. And then every week and I'd go back to my home church and there's Pastor Steve again, uh, hey, Pastor Steve saying, you know, hey, what do you think about the ministry? What do you think about the-? Still kind of prodding me. And then I'd go back to the university campus, and one Tuesday, he came, and we had a prayer meeting, and he left, and I'd had enough. I had to surrender to the Lord, and I remember getting on my knees in that dorm room, saying, God, I don't know what my next step really is. I don't know what you have for me, but I'm going to say yes to you. I've been saying no to you for far too long. And that afternoon, I got on the phone and started to transfer to North Central Bible College to go study to be in the ministry. And so that's where I met Connie. And I mean, it's just an amazing experience learning what it means to be a minister. And then, got down to the end of that, I'm skipping a lot, but uh, I had to get a job, right, in the ministry. And who was the first person to believe in me was... Sam and Jan Tim, pastors in a little church in Watoma, Wisconsin. They may be tuning in too. Hi, guys. Um, This is a recent picture of them. But, man, there's another 
set of pastors that really ministered to me. And, and he was really cool because he was an avid outdoorsman. So now I'm thinking, here's another example of, of pastors that were kind of cool. They weren't like weird people. They were like normal people. They loved the outdoors. And, you know, so it was showing me that God can use whatever you have, whatever you bring to the table, whatever your gifts and desires are, he will use that. And so well, they're the first people that believed in me. I don't think you ever forget your first ministry opportunity and the people that took a chance with you to say, come on, go for it. And so uh, then uh, Connie and I, we, we got married, and for 15 years we traveled on the road as evangelists, singing and preaching around the country, and I've kind of told that story too. Um, and then God opened the door for us to pastor this church, to be pastor. We started this church back in 06 at the Range Inn Golf Club, and uh, there we were. We started the church, and I, I, look, I look back, and I think of those five pastors that made such an incredible contribution into my life. I, I know I wouldn't be here today if there weren't those people that poured into me. I mean, you see one guy up here, one pastor, but guess what? This stage is crowded with five other pastors up here, people that poured into me, people that believed in me, people that saw things in me and helped me develop things that I never knew I had. And I, I think of all of us here today, you may have a story of some pastor in your life, somebody who poured into you, somebody who encouraged you, somebody who held you accountable to something, and maybe you didn't like it at first. You maybe have a story of maybe a Sunday school teacher that really meant something to you. Not all the stories are good. I, I get it. There's, there's people that get wounded by churches and spiritual leaders. Um, you know, they're human just like you. We have fears. We have insecurities. We have doubts. Sometimes we can be over-manipulative when we want to get our way. Um, there's all kinds, uh, we're human just like you. And I wonder if, as you think back to maybe somebody, a spiritual leader in your life, and maybe there was some kind of falling out, maybe it wasn't even with you, maybe it was your parents that got frustrated and left. And because they left, you left, and you got so disconnected from the church that you made all kinds of decisions that led you down a pathway that, you know, hasn't been the best. You're back now. Praise God. Good to see you. And you're giving it another shot or you're thinking, you know, maybe there's more for me in this world and this life than I've known to this point. And, but I want to encourage you, if, if there's any kind of offense you have with a pastor in your past, would you consider forgiving them? Would you consider just letting it go? Again, they're human. They're not perfect, just like you weren't the perfect congregant. You didn't always have the right attitude. Would you be able just to kind of let it go? Um, and maybe even this week, send them a message. I found all these guys. One, uh, Pastor Speed, he's already gone on with the Lord. I found all these guys on, uh, through Facebook, and I sent them a, a note. Hey, I need, a, I need your mugshot. I need your picture. And I told them just what difference they made in my life, and all of them got back to me like, thanks, this really meant a lot. Maybe you could reach out to one of these people in your past and just, and, and, you know, I say forgive them, but don't, don't get a hold of them and say, and I forgive you for blah, 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 because they may not even understand or know that they did wrong, and it's just going to kind of reopen that wound and you know, it's not maybe going to go well. Would you do what Jesus told us to do when it came to forgiveness? Because think about it. Everything that happened, they can't give you back that experience. They can't redo any of that. Who can unscramble those eggs anyways, right? Let it go. Do what Jesus said. He said, you know, they, you may feel like they owe you something. You're in debt to them. They owe you an apology. They owe you to at least acknowledge that what they did you may never get that. So why don't you just, what Jesus said, cancel the debt. Let it go. You know, you know, and say, you don't owe me anymore. And then send them a message. Send them a, a note. It'll mean a lot. I think of, you know, this church and 
you know, I've, I've loved pastoring this church and, and uh, I've poured out my heart to you as a church family and I love it and I look forward to many more you know, years or however long the Lord will have us here. But you know, there's a gift that is really, I think, coming alive within our church. Even as I've been doing this series, I think there's, there's people who have a better understanding of what a prophet is and uh, that apostle spirit, like people who just, they go. They can, they can go into environments and push back the darkness. Or maybe people who have kind of had a teaching gift that's been laying dormant. You just have an ability to take difficult concepts and break it down, and, but you haven't been using it for the church. Maybe you're an expert in your field, at, on the job, in your industry, and you kind of have put that on the shelf when it comes to the church. I believe that God wants to awaken this church and see all five of these spokes come alive. You will be more fulfilled in your life than ever before when you say yes to the opportunities that God presents before you. It'll be so different than getting a paycheck. It'll be so different than the fulfillment you feel in doing maybe what you're doing now. There's something divine. There's something spiritual that connects with the divine purpose that God has created for you. When you connect to that, that's so fulfilling. And I see the gift of pastoring coming alive in this church. There's so many of you who are so good at gathering, at connecting, at coming alongside people. You just, you just have that. There's other people who talk about you. They say, oh, you need to talk to so-and-so because, oh, yeah, you just need to talk to them because they know how, how well you're able to connect with people and you come alongside people. Some of you that are some of our C groups, what we call our small group leaders, you're pastoring people. You're shepherding people. You are. I, t I heard of one, uh, one of our C groups. They meet on Friday nights, and they meet at a restaurant. And they invited us to come one time, and we showed up. And this is our, our mature single adults group. There were 25, 30 single adults there having dinner together. And they take over, right? And they try to pick restaurants where they can, like, have a whole room, and they do. And they, they let people share. They eat, of course, but they... And he came to me a couple of weeks and he go, one of the leaders said, you know, we've been having some problems. We've got some personality conflicts and stuff going on. Pastor Mike, do you know when you give out those little communion things at church, could we get a bunch of those? Because I think we need to have communion in our C group. And I'm like, yeah, let's go for it. So I got him a bunch of communion things. He took it there Friday night and they broke bread together. They had communion and they dealt with what they needed to deal with. Guess what? That leader is pastoring people. He's shepherding people. Another group, our hiking club. We have a hiking club. Did you know that? And it's made up of a lot of people who don't even go to this church, which is so cool. But they meet. And Connie went a few weeks ago. I wasn't able to go. And, and uh, she went. And all of a sudden, the leader, who's one of, one of the couples in our church, the guy stepped up and he prayed such a authentic, powerful prayer before the group ever took their first step. And then at the end, he closed in prayer. And she came back with just, I've never seen him step out. I, I didn't know he could pray that way. There's another person who is shepherding, pastoring people in a hiking club. I think the opportunities are endless. Wouldn't it be awesome? Imagine a church full of people who would find one or two, and you don't have to be just one. There could be several gifts that God wants to flow through you like a current that would make you come alive like never before. And if you're not sure what that is, let's, let's discover what that is. Let's develop. Help God, you know, not help God. He doesn't need our help, but uh, however, you know, God will help develop that in you. And let's be a church that who is not going backwards. We're not getting less and less. That we're just right where God wants us to be. Amen. Well, I love pouring into people, and one of the highlights of being a pastor is empowering, equipping, and raising up people. The hard part is when you got to say goodbye and when somebody moves on to another assignment, and that's what's happen happening in our church. Pastor Ben and Beth Wenrick, I want to cry just <laughs> saying it. This is the third time through, but I'm just as emotional right now. Uh, why don't your whole family come on up here? They've been reassigned uh, by God.
So their whole family is coming up, and uh, we're just going to take a moment in this service. We're going to have other opportunities to, to bless them and encourage them. But uh, Pastor Ben and Beth and your whole family, there's Ari and Joe and Key and Tristan and there's Beth and then Stevie on the end there. Oh, what a family. We have loved you. 13 years we've been on the same team. 13 years. Can you believe it? They started with us at Range and Golf Course. And you were taking, uh, Josiah, you were on like seven. Yeah. Think about it. You grew up in this church, man. And uh, you guys, you, you didn't know where to serve, but you jumped in. You took care of our young adults. And then it, that led to being our children's pastor. And for 13, 13 years later, and now they're going to take a senior pastor job not far from here in Mechanicsburg at Crossroads Community Church. Isn't that awesome? They're going to be the lead pastors. Your whole family's jumping in and going to just love on those people and uh, really help kind of bring some new life to that congregation. And I encourage those of you, that you might be here like, wow, we love them. We maybe would like to be a part of their ministry. If you... If God would like you to just follow them and be supportive of them and, and to just help them to fulfill the assignment God has for them, we bless you to do that. We'd rather have you in the center of God's will than me trying to coax you into staying here. You know, I mean, there might be a number of you that would like to do that. You really uh, want to help them. And, um, so what we're going to do, we're just going to pray for them today. But Memorial Sun, the Sunday of Memorial Weekend, we're going to have church in the park. We're not going to meet here. We're going to meet at Century Lane Park or Franklin Township Park, whatever that park is called. And we're going to have just a little bit of praise and worship. We're going to have the Wendricks share for a few moments just on whatever they want to say as they uh, leave. And then we're just going to have a meal and try to celebrate. <laughs> This is crazy. I didn't. I, I didn't cry like this in the know. other. Sir, I don't know. Whatever it is. I put but. crying serum in your coffee. So <laughs> you just oh well. You know we are so excited for them because they're going to do great. They've been ready. They've been on the edge of this nest for a couple of years now. Okay. They really have, and uh, several opportunities just weren't right. But now is the right time, and you got to move. You got to fly when the time's right. Amen. And your kids. Kids, I know, like some of the students are going to stay in our youth program just until they get, you know, whatever. You guys are going to flourish. My girls did. Our, when we started this church, they were about your guys' age. And we started with only 35 people, and there was only like two or three other youth in the church, and they left Christian Life Assembly, a big church in the hill, for, for really starting over. But I saw them. And this isn't an expe I'm not putting this expectation on you. Only God can help you to, to, to call you and to nurture that in you. But there was an opportunity. They jumped right in. And I'll never forget Tori. She was a middle school student. And you know how insecure middle students can be. And uh, there were like two or three other students who had met for youth group. And she, the Lord, laid on her heart. You know, we got five, but... Let's pray that by the end of the year, we'll have 10. And they got to 10, and then they prayed, let's pray for 25. And then they got 25, and, and Tiffany was learning how to do worship. She could barely play. But the opportunity was there, and she followed God's leading in that. And again, that's not an expectation. Being a pastor's kid is tough enough that you're expected to be in the ministry. Let, let the Lord get a hold of your heart and lead you to do whatever. It might not even be associated with the full-time ministry, and that is fine. You can be blessed and fulfilled in doing that, but oh, what an opportunity. I'm kind of envious in some ways, too, because of just this fresh start. And instead of following the vision God's laid on my heart here, now God's going to birth a vision in you, and it's going to be perfect. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to learn but you know, yeah. in the kingdom of God, we always win. We never lose. We learn. We never, we always win because Christ won the victory. So we're on the winning side. We always win. And we never lose. We just learn. Try, fail, learn. Try, fail, learn. And you're going to learn so much. God's going to Put, gets you outside of your comfort zone, outside the, this nest. And uh, there's, it's going to be scary sometimes, but he'll give you the faith and the strength. 
You, instead of, you know, I got Richie's cell phone number. I'm going to need to call you as we go through this process. But guess what? You got my cell phone. I know. We're on our favorites list, so uh, you need to call. And, and there's so many people here that want to love you. So Memorial Day weekend is a Sunday we're just going to celebrate with them. And uh, you may not be here that weekend. You may be out of town. But between now and then, just encourage them. Just love them and let them know what, you know, express your appreciation to them and how, what a difference they've made in your life. Amen? Wow. Okay, well, why don't you stand and extend a hand this way and let's pray for this family. Okay, Father? Wow. Oh, this doesn't surprise you and this doesn't, uh, this is just the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And so we send them off in blessing. Oh, Lord, we're grateful for how you speak to us. We're grateful that your timing is perfect. We pray the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon them, Lord, like never before, that you will empower them and give them vision and give them faith that will take them way farther than human energy or effort or human understanding. It'll be such a divine thing. And we'll be able to support, but we'll be able to watch from, a, from afar too and celebrate with them. I thank you in advance for the hundreds of souls that are going to come into the kingdom because of the way and the, the, they're going to reach out to people. And we bless them in all their endeavors in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. We love you guys and uh, God bless you too for coming today. Make sure you greet them and in the next couple of weeks. But I thank you. I pray that you have a powerful week and we'll see you again real soon. God bless you.